Welcome to the World Affairs Council of the Monterey Bay Area. We hope you enjoy the following quick take on international affairs while we all wait out the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Anshu Chatterjee, and uh, I teach South Asia political development at the Naval Postgraduate School. Thank you for joining me. Uh, uh, thank you for joining me. At the, in this talk. I would also like to thank the World Affairs Council for giving me an opportunity to give my perspective on what is happening in India today. As you all know, uh, India is currently governed by uh, the BJP, the Bharatiya Janta Party, which is a Hindu nationalist party. In 2019, the BJP came to power uh, by mobilizing 37% of vote, which gave it a full uh, majority in the parliament. The man in charge is Narendra Modi, uh, and his government currently faces uh, several challenges. So before we can start talking about them, let me uh, share my PowerPoints with you. All right, hopefully everybody can see this. Okay, so India, this is the first slide is basically a celebration after the 2019 victory. Second slide basically points out the challenges India is facing. Most ex experts agree these are the major issues. Uh, the economy has seen uh, on and off uh, slow growth for a decade now. Uh, we've also seen an increasing uh, China-India skirmishes at the border. Uh, Hindu nationalism is a bit of a challenge because it causes protests and disruptions in civil society. And then, of course, we have pandemic that has shown up this year, which is a major uh, health and an economic crisis. Now, given all these things, the big question here is, how, has B, how is BJP able to manage all this? Uh, most people would agree that given the challenges India is facing, that governments would face a, a weakening or loss of approval. But what's happening with BJP, as the latest survey shows, is actually the approval has gone up. Narendra Modi currently has 78% approval rating. So how has the government managed to do this? So given that, this talk basically tries to explain how the BJP that, and Narendra Modi have managed to maintain high approval ratings given the challenges facing the country. So quickly, who the BJP is. BJP has historically, uh, the Hindu nationalism has historically been around uh, since the British period. But BJP as a political party emerged in the 1950s. And to make a long story short, it's a conservative party with primarily an upper caste and business constituency. And they have continued to gain constituencies and popularity since 1980s, when India adopted a more market-driven economic model. It is highly very, it is also very hawkish on defense. So to come to the first challenge, BJP's majority, uh, in 2000, if you look at the chart here, let's begin with looking at this chart. Now, if you look at this chart, in the past decade, the economy has seen some volatility. It uh, declined and then it came up and, and so on. So Narendra Modi actually first became a prime minister in 2014 as part of a coalition government. The coalition in 2014 election campaigned that uh, Indian economy was not doing well and they can do better than the incumbent, which was the Indian National Congress Party. So as most voters in the world would uh, vote, they, the Indian voters also voted out the incumbent and they voted in a new government. Now, BJP came into power and Narendra Modi became a prime minister in 2014, heading a coalition government. And what we see is a, a market rally, GDP goes up a little bit, um, then in 2016, it starts declining again. And 2017, it's low, and then it starts going up in 2019, which takes us to the next election. Now, in the next election campaign in 2019, BJP basically campaigned uh, on two things, on two fronts. It appealed to rule poor for the first time. It promised them more toilets and gas in every kitchen. It seemed very simple, but this is very important for Indian poor. Uh, it also appealed to the middle class and Indian elite uh, as someone who can make India into a global power and man bring manufacturing back into the country, highlighting the fact that manufacturing has left the country and that all these challenges India is facing are actually coming from outside. So it basically moved the spectrum to external sphere, external theater. Uh, 
Uh, and it was bolstered by the next challenge India is facing, which is the China threat. So for those of you who don't know, uh, India has seen increasing uh, skirmishes at the India-China border. Now, what is the background of this? Well, in 1947, when India became independent, China claimed uh, several territories, arguing that the British had actually put them, uh, had um, acquired them and made them part of India. So these became what's called the disputed territories. Now, these are the yellow areas if you look at the map. Now, in 1962, these two countries went to war on what is uh, what is now known as the Aksai Chin, which is the yellow area here, if you look at my cursor. Now, India lost that war and lost that territory, which was part of Kashmir, to China. Now, since then, things have been fairly stable till, last, till we come into the last decade, where we have seen increasing aggression at the border. So there's Dalit Beg Oldi, 2013, and then another 2014, and the latest being uh, Galwan Valley, a few months ago, where 22 Indian soldiers were killed. Uh, and there is one currently going on. So India's threat perceptions uh, since 1962 war have been shaped by China rather than anything else. Now, India, Indian security experts and uh, observers agree that, the chi that uh, China's support for Pakistan is also an issue. Can move this here. Now, China and Pakistan have an alliance, and uh, people argue, experts argue, or BJP has argued, that uh, Pakistan's ability to influence politics in Kashmir and support the insurgency and support terrorist organizations, such as lashkar e taiba are due to support it gets from China. What does China do? China basically aids Pakistan economy. It is currently building a corridor there at 62 billion, which is an investment into Pakistan. Uh, it also aids it with this nuclear program and development aid. So uh, Indian security experts have argued and defense forces have argued that the ability of lashkar e taiba type organizations to come and launch uh, terrorist attacks in India, uh, highlighted by what happened in 2001 in the parliament and then 2008 in, in Mumbai, are just some examples, is due to the fact that Pakistan gets aid from China. So China, so Pakistan, the Pakistani threat is part of its uh, larger uh, framework on, on China. And BJP and uh, the conservative and hawkish parties have all argued that this has been going on for years. And the previous Indian National Congress, who is not hawkish, rely too much on di diplomacy when they should have been bolstering the defense forces. Now, were, is BJP able to defense de uh, bolster the defense forces? Absolutely not, because it basically relies on the Indian economy, which has not been doing well. So while the narrative is there, it has not been able to uh, bolster Indian defense forces as well. But the narrative remains. In other words, the narrative is on external forces, on external threats. So in 2019, uh, uh, based on this narrative, BJP comes to power and full majority. Now, uh, after winning a full majority in 2019, the BJP uh, made uh, two controversial decisions which affect the Indian minorities, specifically the Muslims in India. First, what it did was it removed Article 370, which is a framework uh, under which Kashmir joined India in 1948. Article 370, in short, stipulates that the Indian central authorities will provide border security to Kashmir and help with development and bureaucracy and administration, but it was basically going to remove, remain out of internal politics. It was not going to uh, influence uh, elections and who the, who the political parties were going to be uh, and how they were going to campaign. So it gave uh, Kashmir an autonomy, internal autonomy, while being part of India. Now, Hindu nationalists have historically argued that uh, this autonomy under Article 370 has allowed Pakistan to in interfere in influence politics in Kashmir, as well as it has allowed insurgent groups uh, to be funded by Pakistan and terrorist organizations to come in uh, into Kashmir. So upon coming to power, it immediately removed Article 370, 
But the day before, uh, it arrested 6,000 uh, Kashmiri elite, political elite, as well as journalists in, in, in the state. 400 of them continue to languish uh, in prisons today. Uh, the second most, uh, the second controversial decision BJP made was, is actually in December 2020, not January, was the Citizenship Amendment Act. Under this act, India offered refuge to uh, minorities living in Islamic countries, those uh, uh, who could be possibly fa facing a persecution. So the government passed that act, offering refugees to minorities living in Islamic countries, all of them except for Muslims. So it was clearly a discriminatory act. So upon passing this, of course, we see a lot of disruption in society, protests break out. Uh, soon after that, the government uh, decided to start counting its citizens. And those who could not prove that they had been in India prior to five years earlier would face deportation. Uh, given the fact that the government had given refuge to all minorities except Muslims, Muslims felt this registration would impact them the most. So as a consequence of this, we see major protests breaking out in, in January 2020. And here's a picture of some of these protests breaking out. So clearly disruption uh, in civil society. Soon after this, or in middle of this protest, you have the pandemic hit uh, India. So by end of February, it was very clear that COVID had reached India and uh, government initiated a major lockdown in the middle of March. So far, India has registered about 4 million cases of COVID. Uh, some people argue these numbers are low. India has also seen 70,000 deaths associated with, uh, with the pandemic. Again, some people argue that these numbers are low. But, uh, over, uh, but the, in terms of the curve, uh, it has not occurred yet. The cases are still rising in India. Now, in addition to being a major health crisis, COVID is also a major economic crisis in India. Uh, from April to June, which is the first fiscal quarter, the government faced 23% contraction in the economy. Experts argue that overall, this fiscal year, if things go as planned and optimistically, India will basically uh, only see five to six percent contraction. Only is a, is again a is is a optimistic word. Now, uh, in addition to the economy, which is going to impact the poor the most, uh, the way the government uh, implemented the lockdown is also a severe issue which has not been addressed by the administration. In fact, the government has hidden, has tried to hide this fact. Uh, upon the lockdown, uh, which was implemented by the police and security forces, uh, you have uh, the, the, day the day laborers in urban areas basically start leaving the cities because they, their income stop and they don't have housing. So they start walking back to their homes, to their villages, where they came from. So you have a major migration occur on foot. The government is not able to contain this. So as a result of this, you have these people from urban areas leaving to go into their villages across the country, taking COVID with them. And uh, so in addition to the fact that this is a major health crisis, you also have a major economic crisis because these people don't have income and they are facing job losses. So what has the government done? It has tried to implement uh, some subsidies to the villages, but again, this is a, a major economic uh, and a health threat, which, is, which India is currently facing. Now, where are all the critics on all this? So the lockdown, the way it has been implemented, has also allowed the government to uh, suppress criticism. We know that at least 55 journalists who have questioned this have been arrested, prominent journalists. Some have been threatened. Um, some are facing, uh, some of them have been attacked. And civil rights organizations and leaders have also uh, faced such threats. Uh, some of them have been arrested in this process. And all this has been actually done under the lockdown while the majority of Indians are sitting in their homes. So this is definitely a problem. Um, and which the government, uh, this is a problem, and the government continues to maintain its narrative that these, all these threats are coming from, uh, from outside, including the pandemic, which actually came from outside, uh, and that it's doing the best it can. So this is how 
the Modi administration is able to maintain its uh, its popularity by focusing on on focusing on the threats as external threats that they as a strong defense hawkish party are the only ones who can handle this so we have seen uh, popularity rates actually go up for narendra modi in this process i'm going to share the last picture with you nice picture and now i've run out of time so thank you for listening to this and uh, please feel free to email me and ask me any questions you have thank you very much Thank you.